I think that and, and the alliance between men and women is a very important one across the board, not just in Saudi. I mean, yeah, and Al Sharif had her father and her brother's support, and so many other women who were breaking the ban on driving had their their male relative support too. But when you look at you, when you look at Egypt, and what's happening in Egypt and Tunisia, Tunisia and other countries? I mean, there was a story in the New York Times today that drove me absolutely nuts, and I was telling Catherine about this because you know, on 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 its surface, the story seems to be good, which is that. He, we, they, they, they feature a young woman called Samira Ibrahim who was subjected along with 17 other activists to so-called virginity tests by, the, by Egyptian soldiers in March of last year. So these so-called virginity tests are basically sexual assaults that the military used because they claimed that they wanted to ensure that these female activists that detained were virgins so that they didn't accuse the military of raping them while in detention as if only virgins could be raped. So in this story, I mean, we could have a panel alone on these so-called virginity tests, but Two of the women spoke out. One of them gave an interview from the very beginning and was chastised across the board and called a liar by everybody because the military denied it had happened at the time. It was a very sensitive time for Egypt because the military was still portraying itself as the safeguards of the revolution. But a young woman called Salwa Hosseini spoke out and broke that taboo of speaking out about speaking about, about the military. Samira Ibrahim, who was featured in the New York Times story today, has actually raised, is, is suing the military. There's, there's this woman from a very conservative part of Egypt who was suing the military and standing up and saying, you can't do this to me. And the reason the other woman isn't is because she doesn't have ID, identification papers and you need ID to, to, to raise a lawsuit in Egypt. But what really, really enraged me about this story in the New York Times is that it said, you know, it gave all these statistics about women and sexual assault that I quoted 100 women being sexually assaulted. It quoted one of my favorite feminists in Egypt, a woman called Mosna Hassan, who's the executive director of a feminist movement called Nazra, which means vision. And she's fantastic. And she was saying, you know, we don't want men to be the only guarantors of our safety and security on the streets. Because if we have to wait for men to protect us against the sexual violence and the physical violence of the army, it will mean that men will set basically the guidelines for us. It will be, I will protect you as long as you do this. I will protect you as long as you behave in that way. So here's an Egyptian feminist saying this, and she's saying it clearly and openly. And she's encouraging other Egyptian women to go out there and protect ourselves. And yet the story says that Egyptian women, and, and they, they mentioned that woman who was dragged across Tahrir Square and stripped down to her bra. And if anybody calls a blue bra girl, I swear I will kick you where it hurts. Because she's not a blue bra girl. She's a woman. And she must not be reduced to the color of her underwear. But anyway, so they use this woman and they say Egyptian women, basically female revolutionaries, are mostly silent victims who risk becoming these icons of the male-dominated uprising. And that enrages me. Where is the silence? Where is the silence when you hear women like Ebtehal and myself? Where is the silence when Mosna Hassan is telling the New York Times, we will not wait for Egyptian men to protect us? Where is the silence? And so it looks like the New York Times is doing us a favor by showing us, look, here is some, we're writing about women now. They never interview women when it comes to political stories in the Middle East. I mean, obviously everything is political, but when it comes to, you know, they never pick up a phone and, and speak to female experts about what's happening in the region. But the one time when they focus on women is women as victims. So look at, look at the irony here. We're talking about men and women on the ground fighting together, and yet the New York Times is portraying women only in, in, in this context of being victims, but yet they have, they have these feminists and these women who are standing up to the military. A 26-year-old Egyptian is suing the military, and the New York Times is telling me that Egyptian women risk falling, risk becoming silent, or are mostly silent victims of a revolution and icons of these men. It enrages me. So you've got to ask how you look at women in that part of the world. What, what is the lens through which you look at women in that part of the world? Because they have far outstripped you. They're not waiting for you to look at them in the diversity that they, that they come under. Because as Isabel mentioned and Ibtahal mentioned, there are men and women and, and the support goes across both camps. So I think part of trying to understand what's happening in the region with these uprisings and revolutions is understanding that for too long you have looked at that part of the world through a very narrow lens that portrays women there as victims, that portrays Muslims there as barbarians, that portrays the dictators there as you know, these benign men who give, you know, all of these givens that, are, that have very surely been dismantled by the various uprisings that you're seeing because that's the least you can do to honor the courage of the people there.